Hello and welcome to DNA Today. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world, shows packed with news stories, lessons, interviews, all to keep you updated and educated on the ever-changing world of genetics. You can tune in every Monday at 11.30 a.m. to hear me live on whus.org or on the radio, 91.7 FM, if you're in the stores area. You can listen to all episodes on dnapodcast.com. Every episode that I have broadcast here on WHUS and other episodes are on dnapodcast.com. So what am I talking about today? Today's show is kind of a history meets microbiology and genetics. Uh, I'm, take, I'm talking about 10 women who made major contributions to the scientific field of microbiology and genetics. They kind of overlap a little bit, so I figured I'd throw them all in there. So you'll hear another theme throughout this episode that I, I want you listeners to pay attention to. Many of these women did not receive nearly enough credit as they deserved for these projects. A lot of their supervisors received the credit or even their husbands that were lab partners. Uh, they really, most of them that I'm talking about here, did not get the credit they deserved, um, whether that's snubbed of the Nobel Prize or, or other very um, prestigious awards. So let's get into it. The first woman is Nettie Stevens. Uh, she was in genetics and she was American. And she was able to support her hypothesis that a fetus's sex was not determined by environment, but rather by chromosomes. Yeah, back then, people actually thought it was the environmental situation um, during conception that uh, identified whether it was going to be a female or male. Um, so she was the one that was actually able to explain and uh, support her her hypothesis that chromosomes co contributed by the two parents at the time of conception was the deciding factor and it wasn't the environment. To us today, it's like, obviously that's the case. But back then it was a little bit different. Um, she was living from 1861 to 1912. So back in that time period. Now, Ned Nettie Stevens supported herself through her schooling and quickly achieved fellowships abroad. When applying for funding for her research, both her supervisors, Morgan and Edmund Beecher Wilson, wrote strongly supporting letters of recommendation. Morgan expressed out of all of the graduate students, he, quote, had no one that was as capable and independent in research, end quote, as her. So Nettie Stevens and Wilson published their independent work around the same time as each other, which had the same conclusion, that sex was determined by chromosomes, which we still, you know, uh, that's still the case today. We know that now. Um, however, Nettie Stevens confidently w worded her work saying, quote, it's perfectly clear that an egg fertilized by a spermazone containing a larger head of chromosome develops into a female. While Wilson's language was a little bit more doubtful, it wasn't uh, straight cut to the point. This is how it is. So she never received the recognition she deserved for it. So this is just the first woman that I'm talking about here. Instead, Thomas H. Morgan is attributed with a discovery even though at this time of discovery, he shared beliefs with the general public that sex was determined by environmental factors, such as the dominance of the man during conception. So even though he actually believed that, that, it, that, it, that it, was, it was environmental factors, he went down in history as being the one that actually discovered this and believed in this when it was Nettie Stevens. So Nettie Stevens died of breast cancer only 11 years after her career started. So uh, another another theme throughout um, the, these women is that a lot of them died. Our next woman scientist on the list is Hilde Mangold. She was in experimental embryology and she was German. She discovered embryos organizers, um, which I put quotes around uh, the word organizers. The cells that grow in the neural tube, which is where the spinal cord and brain begin to develop um, as an embryo. Now, she was able to show how these cells direct the growth of organisms. She conducted an experiment to display that when cells were inserted into the embryo, the cells would assimilate into the embryo, becoming normal flesh. But if the reverse was inserted, there was a different result. So if the cells from the organizer or neural tube were inserted into another embryo, then these cells would maintain their development of the nervous system, of the central nervous system. So in the latter that I explained, Hilde Mangold had produced tadpoles with two heads. During this experiment, she was working under Hans Spiemann and was earning her doctorate in zoology working. And Spiemann gave her a high grade for her work. Being her advisor and director of the experiment, he added his own name to her work, even though he was advising her, but he wasn't doing any of the work. He was just able to add his name because he was in a support, superior position to her. It was published the year she died, and Spiemann earned the Nobel Prize in 
um, physiology or medicine for her discovery. Now, Hilde Mangold died at the early age of 26 and did not see the impact of her research that it had on experimental embryology. And after her death, her name seemed to die with her until a fellow embryologist named Victor Hamburger, his name comes up a lot um, in the women that I will be talking about, so he spoke up for her, and they had worked together under Speeman, and Hamburger revealed later that he and his fellow peers were able to publish their work without Speeman's name attached, unlike Hilde Mangold. So she had the name attached, but all of her peers didn't have their advisor's name attached, but, you know, possibly because she was a woman, she didn't have that kind of career established, um, unlike other her other peers that were men. Our next woman is Charlotte... Are back, and she is in genetics and she was German. She's been called the mother of mutagenesis. She made a major discovery that mustard gas causes genetic mutations, and this answer was one that was sought after by the United Kingdom's War Office, who wanted to understand more how this gas affected the body because it was being used during wartime. And she looked for genetic mutations in the X chromosome of male flies who'd been exposed to the mustard gas. During her research, she was also exposed to this harmful gas. Um, when we look back in science history and research history, a lot of scientists that were working on things that were harmful to the body, radiation, um, or we didn't really know the effects, um, were exposed to it and unfortunately had a lot of the side effects later um, and developed a lot of that later. But after only a mere two months, she was able to collect enough data to support her claims and in 1941, forwarded them to her, her advisor, Herman J. Mueller, and received back very encouraging words. Quote, we are thrilled by your major discovery, opening great theoretical and practical field. Congratulations. It wasn't until 1947, that's six years later, after she got this note from her advisor. So this is after the war. This class, classified research was able allowed to be published in Nature before it was kept under wraps because you don't want to have the enemies hearing about the research of um, you know, th this chemical that was used during the war. But after the war was over, 1947, her research was allowed to be published in Nature, the scientific journal, and her partner during this research, um, Robinson, was not awarded, unlike her, with prizes such as the Keith Prize in 1948. And he felt betrayed that she had accepted it. However, she was desperate for the mere 50 pounds um, that came with the prize. And she really was not making much money, which is why she had to, um, she was kind of, she was desperate to accept the 50 pounds. But this is kind of a uh, reverse um, role here of um, her male partner not being awarded where she was. So this is a little bit of a different example, but she made major contributions to um, the field of mutagenesis. Barbara McClintock, she was an American and into genetics. And she's a pretty big name. McClintock is known for her groundbreaking discoveries of mobile genetic elements at the young age of 29. And it's been named one of the greatest experiments of modern biology. So that, that's a pretty big title. She spent most of her career working with corn. She bred strains of corn together and found that kernels didn't necessarily inherit traits from one parent or the other. So it wasn't like this corn will uh, look exactly like the uh, maternal or paternal. It, it wasn't one or the other. It was kind of a blending of traits, a mix of traits. So breeding a waxy purple corn, so say that's the uh, father, the waxy purple corn, and a non-waxy, non-purple corn uh, mother could result in a blending of traits. So you have waxy and non-purple, which is a blending of these traits. It doesn't, rep it doesn't um, have the same phenotype as either one, but a mix. So in these mismatched cases, chromosomes had traded places. She began in her first year of graduate school identifying discrete parts of corn's chromosomes. And this was a project her advisor had been working on, but she took on the challenge on her own and had finished in a mere two or three days. And as one can imagine, this didn't make her advisor look very good because she kind of waltzes in, says, ah, oh, this is what you're working on. Let, let me have a crack at it. Gets it in two to three days. So she was very, very bright. McClintock had a very positive attitude about her career, and although she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1983, she was not really embraced in many of the labs and universities she worked in. Her Nobel Prize winning work was respected by colleagues decades after she had published it, but the first time she presented on these jumping genes, as some people called them, 
Her presentation ended with silence from the crowd, and they were just not sold on the idea. It sounded very odd. It, it, wasn't, um, it really wasn't embraced. James Watson, who was one of three to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for the discovery of the structure of DNA, I've talked a lot about him before. Um, he's kind of a household name. Uh, so he explained that she was ahead of her time, saying, quote, it's really that science caught up with Barbara. So she was able to understand this way before a lot of other scientists were. And obviously she discovered it. But um, even when she presented her work, people were not sold on the idea, but she was very much ahead of her time. Salome Glucksen Welsh co-founded the field of developmental genetics. And so she was in developmental genetics and she was also German. She attributes much of her accomplishments to looking at the big picture, being aware of other fields and how they may impact hers and really having a global perspective on things. Welsh worked under Hans Spiemann, who I mentioned that Mangold, um, Hildy Mangold, worked under. And she expressed she thought Spiemann didn't respect women as equals, which, you know, this is the second case we're talking about Spiemann not um, respecting women as equals in the workplace. And working in Spiemann's lab, Welsh befriended Victor Hamburger, just as Mangold did. And her husband was Jewish and was fired from his university position for his faith, but immediately hired at Columbia. So the couple moved from Berlin to New York. And Welsh accepted an unpaid position, also at Columbia, where she published her first paper outlining the goals of her new field of developmental genetics and research methodology. Here she used mouse embryos to study the effects of naturally occurring genetic mutations in the T-complex. And the T-complex is a group of genes that direct the development of mouse tails and kind of how it's growing and everything. So these discoveries had had significant impacts in the mammalian genetics. For all of her work in developmental genetics, she was awarded the National Medal of Science in 1993 when she was 85 and still hard at work. So she's an example of a woman that, uh, you know, was, uh, was alive, uh, that she lived a very long time. Um, but she was also hard at work um, into her later years. Rita Levy Montalcini was all about grand gestures and risks. She was in the field of neuroembryology and she was Italian. She was a woman who didn't let other people prevent her from what she wanted to do, even if it meant he having a secret lab in a bedroom. There she learned more about developmental, the development of fibrous nerve cells. And she was resourceful and recruited her family to help. Her brother built an incubator for eggs. And it was Victor Hamburger who discovered her work in journals, and he was the founder of developmental neurobiology. So together they set their minds to answering how nerve cells form and die together. Levy Montchalchny noticed that after being grafted onto a chicken embryo, a mouse tumor spurred nerve growth. Seeing the potential discovery, she placed the tumor where it was only showing sharing blood with the chicken embryo and found success. It increased its growth. So Hamburger described his partner as, quote, an extremely ingenious woman, and he took on a mentor role, and she and her new partner, Stanley Cohen, identified growth factors which had a major impact on many applications, degenerative um, disease progression, skin grafts, and damaged spinal cord protection. So this one thing really impacted a lot of different fields and applications. And the duo were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology for this work. She was hard at work work until her death at the age of 103. So I think she takes the cake for um, longest working and oldest. Anne McLaren was British and she was in genetics. She was the first person to successfully produce a test tube baby mouse through in vitro fertilization. Her career with mice began with observing embryonic development, focusing on uterine environmental influence factors. So while in the uterus, while the embryos in the uterus what affected the growth in terms of the environment? Now, the wait for a new generation of mice to be born was around 20 days, and it was time-consuming. It would kind of lag her research. So she required a faster, more efficient method to transfer embryos between mice. So instead of waiting for someone to create one, she went out and did it. So later, a Nature article revealed that an eight-cell blastocyst had been cultured and inspired a new project. McLaren, Don Donald Mitchie, who was her research partner and at the time husband, and John Biggers, who studied embryonic chicken bones for organ culture, three of them teamed up for a new venture taking the Nature article one step further, so mice born from in vitro fertilization. Biggers cultured mice embryo to the blastocyst stage and then gave them to McLaren, who transferred these blastocysts into surrogates. 
McLaren contacted Biggers when the babies were born with a telegram back in the day exclaiming, quote, four bottled babies born, which I'm sure whoever was passing along that telegram, it was a little bit weird. McLaren worked with the Warnock Committee between 1982 and 1984 to standardize this process and that it was conducted in a safe and ethical manner in the world. Lynn Maragillis was an American and in biology, and she questioned the world and set out to learn firsthand in nature how it worked. She was very much into figuring things out from a young age. And it was with this mindset she figured out the bacterial origin of the organelle mitochondrial mitochondria in eukaryotic cells. So she recognized similarities between bacteria and mitochondria. Others before her had recognized this too, she wasn't the first, but their ideas had been rejected and they really didn't pursue them to convince other people and convince the scientific community that this is the case. So she proposed that one bacteria had engulfed the other and instead of one out surviving the other, both had survived and developed a symbiotic relationship. So the bacteria, um, well, both bacteria, because you have one bigger one uh, engulfing the other, that they actually could help each other survive instead of one out surviving the other. So they developed this symbiotic relationship. And this symbiosis contrasted what most scientists believed at the time. They were using Darwin's survival of the fittest ideas to explain relationships in nature, that whatever was most fit to survive, you know, out of the two or how many different uh species you're looking at, that was the one that was going to go on to survive while the others would die out. Now, this was completely twisted. This is that it's a symbiotic relationship and that both are actually helping each other survive. So very, very opposite. Margulis showed that in plant cells, smaller bacteria within the bigger cell are chloroplasts and in animals, the smaller bacteria are mitochondria. Now, these bacteria allowed plant cells to convert light energy and animals to take in oxygen. That's their roles, that these organelles, that's their roles in the cells. And after 15 rejections of her articles, she finally got her work published in the journal, the Journal of Theoretical Biology, in 1967. She later lengthened that into a book called The Origin of Eukaryotic Cells. Her daughter, Jennifer Margulis, said that Lynn Margulis, quote, called herself a spokesperson for the microcosm, as she often talks about the importance of microorganisms and was very focused on that. So that was her major discovery. And Rosalind Franklin, I had uh, one of my first episodes here at WHUS uh, was all about Rosalind Franklin. Um, so if you've heard that, you're familiar with this. But a little recap on um, her history. She was in genetics and she was British. She is most famously depicted in James Watson's personal recount of their discovery of the structure of DNA in his memoir titled The Double Helix, um, which I really, really encourage people to read. It's um, a good insight on really the process of getting there. And James Watson uh, tells it as a, a story, kind of taking you through. They figured this part out and this part out. And okay, is it a double helix? It's not, you know, so they really, he really gets into all the different things when they had the base pairs wrong because the textbooks had it differently than, um, than biochemists had and everything. So, um, it's, it's a very interesting, um, walk through their discovery. Um, but the portrayal of Franklin is very, uh, very off. She's presented as rude, violent, and not serious competition that she was kind of just the woman on the sidelines. She was dismissed by Watson as a colleague, and he belittled her by calling her Rosie, a name she didn't like. Now, this representation was criticized by many scientists, such as Barbara McClintock, who I talked about earlier. In other sources, such as the Dark Lady of DNA, she's shown a strong, inspiring woman who was determined at the young age of 15 to dedicate her life to science. That, that really was her goal. And she was snubbed of the Nobel Prize, dying at age 37 before it was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the structure of DNA. But even if she was alive, would she really have shared the credit with James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins? Unfortunately, this is doubtful. Um, even So you have to be alive to get the award. But there's also a cap of three people that can receive it. So she probably would not have um, beaten out one of the other three just because she was a woman. And, and unfortunately, um, that's kind of how, how it was back then. Now, Franklin's contribution to this major discovery began while working at King's College London, where she assembled an X-ray distraction laboratory. So she began to research the structure of DNA and found that DNA takes two forms, form A and form B. 
And it was a photo of Form B, photo 51, that's now very famous, that provided Watson and Crick the information that DNA was a double helix structure. So this photo was one of two vital pieces of information to discover the structure of DNA, and both were taken without the knowledge and certainly not the consent of Franklin. The second piece of information um, that really was needed to establish that the structure was a double helix and everything else about the structure, um, it was a report to a government committee Um, They asked for her to explain her work and what she was doing. So it was only intended for the committee, um, and Max Perotes, who was on this committee, secretly shared it with Watson and Crick, and then when the duo published in Nature that they had discovered the structure of DNA, and it was correct, they did not give any credit to Franklin, even though two of their major pieces of information to figure this out was from her, and it was her work. So although Franklin and Watson clearly did not get along, um, as we can see from Watson's depiction uh, of her in his memoir, um, she did become good friends with Crick and his wife. Um, Her relationship with Maurice Wilkins, on the other hand, that was a rough relationship. It started out with a miscommunication of her role in the lab. So when she came into the lab, she was told that she was partners with Maurice Wilkins. But Maurice thought that Maurice Wilkins was on vacation when she came in, and he thought that she was working for him, under him. Um, so it, it was a miscommunication. It did not start out the relationship very good. But she, but Rosalind Franklin certainly did achieve a lot, although she was not um, awarded as much as she definitely should have been, in my opinion. Not only did she provide the work to identify the structure of DNA, as I've talked about here, she also made major contributions to the filtration properties of types of coal during World War II and the tobacco mosaic virus. Um, Towards the end of her life, she made some uh, major discoveries with that. Our last woman scientist is Esther Lederberg. She was an American geneticist, and she provided a foundation for future research in genetic inheritance in bacteria, gene regulation, and genetic recombination. And Stanley Falcow, a professor in cancer research, described her, quote, as one of the great pioneers in bacterial genetics, experimentally and methodology. She was a genius in the lab. End quote. And she co invented a simple method, replica plating, which, if you've taken microbiology, you've heard of this, you've studied this, it was probably on your exams. So, this is to reproduce bacterial colonies in masses while maintaining the original geometry of the colonies. So, if you have a plate and say you have a lot of colonies to the left and then a couple um, down on the right or something, when you transfer that, it will be exactly the same. So, she was able to. Um, make this technique and it allows for rapid screening of bacteria for desired mutations. That's really the purpose of it. And uh, Lederberg was overshadowed by her research partner and also husband. Uh, She's the second woman I've mentioned that her research partner was her husband, Joshua Lederberg. He received the Nobel Prize for the work that they conducted together and she was not included on that prize. Paul shared that, quote, she deserved credit for the discovery of the lambda phage, her work on the F fertility factor, and especially replica plating, which I just explained. Now, Lederberg was a trailblazer in women's rights, holding a position as a full-time professor at Stanford when there were very few positions for women. She was kind of one of the first to be a woman professor. And that was that was a big deal in women's rights and just women empowerment and the progression of women in the field of science. She began as a teaching assistant and struggled financially to the point where she stole frog legs from labs to eat for dinner. So definitely um, she struggled, but she was able to accomplish so much. And she really was a very inspiring woman, as all of these women were, all that they achieved through hardship and um, a, a lot of a lot of different experiences that they went to um a lot of them moving from Europe to the United States to uh, avoid being um, pursued by Germans because of their Jewish ancestry and um, really a a lot of great stories behind this. And I was only able to cover, um, you know, tidbits for each one and a a short little synopsis. So if you're interested in reading about uh, more women who change science and not just microbiology and genetics, but all kinds of areas of science, there's a fantastic book that I got a lot of these names from that I've discussed here on the show today. The book is called Headstrong, 52 Women Who Changed Science and the World. Um, it was published in April 2015, and it, it really is a fantastic book. And 
each there's a short you know it's usually about three pages per woman so you really get um a little snippet even more than I've given today on the show of kind of their background where they came from and how they got to accomplish the things they did um so it's very interesting to read through their profiles of these really bright female scientists so definitely recommend that um that book is by Rachel Swabe so um so check it out. It's a, it's a more recent book. So definitely, definitely worth reading through. I want to thank you guys for listening to today's episode of DNA Today. You can tune in next week at Monday at 1130 a.m. on whs.org or 91.7 FM to learn more about genetics. Uh, I like to talk about pretty much anything about genetics uh, that seems to uh, pique my interest. And if there's something that you would like me to talk about and, and for me to research that so that you don't have to, and I can just explain it to you, um, I'm happy to do that. You can send in emails um, at info at dnapodcast.com to kind of suggest a topic or ask a question or anything that you uh, want to say. If you're more of a social media person, you can follow on Twitter at DNA Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Kira Deneen, K-I-R-A-D-I-N-E-E-N. And of course, there's dnapodcast.com, which has all this information. So dnapodcast.com is the one to remember. So thanks for listening and join me next week again, Monday at 1130 a.m. to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.